you everyone for uh, sparing your time and attending this session. So we're going to be discussing on uh, low cost healthcare delivery uh, impact versus sustainability. And uh, before we start posing in the questions, I, uh, you know, let me just set the stage here on where we are today in, 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 uh, with respect to healthcare. Um, you probably know all the, you know, the larger numbers that we all keep talking about. We are $70 billion uh, industry today. Uh, gaming are probably hoping to reach a $280 billion in the next five or six years. Uh, but with all these numbers and the kind of strides that probably healthcare has uh, achieved so far, the, the uh, problems of affordability, um, quality and accessibility still remain. And uh, what we also want to do in this uh, discussion is basically try and address that. How do we really uh, address the uh, affordability and ac accessibility uh, problem? Uh, so where we are right now is uh, we have almost like 3% of our physicians uh, in India are, are only in rural areas and only 25% in probably uh, semi-urban areas. So uh, keeping that in mind, we also know that our GDP spend probably is one of the uh, lowest in the entire BRICS. Uh, uh, you know, we are at 4% versus the average of BRICS is around 6.5%. We also know that um, around every, every year around uh, 40 million uh, people are pushed into poverty just because of the cost that they are spending into on, on, on healthcare. So keeping that in mind, the, you know, let's get into the uh, issues on healthcare. And uh, the first question I want to pose uh, to my panelists and especially um, uh, to Casey and, uh, and Ankur uh, is, is, is uh, low cost healthcare del delivery a myth? Uh, so answer is yet to come through. Um, uh, we have seen yesterday, like for example, Arvind was a great inspiration to see that at least in one segment we are able to see that it is possible, you know. Um, so it will need uh, multiple approaches, multiple people working together and to uh, really uh, try to find out what is the optimum solution, you know. Uh, my personal belief is that uh, in India, if we take particularly, is that uh, we have been obsessed since post-independence with tertiary healthcare and tertiary education, given the fact the government has put all IITs, IIMs, PGI and AIMS. Whereas a similar amount of effort, if would have been put, then I don't know what would have happened, you know. So my personal belief is that if we had to really healthcare accessible and affordable, 70-80% investment needs to go to primary care and preventive care, you know. NHS is a good model um, uh, to start with. I'm not saying you just replicate that model. Uh, but there are a lot of good things uh, about that. So that's uh, point number one. Point number two is that I was talking to an uh, investor, uh, a venture capital fund based in UK, but they invest in Africa. And what is very, very interesting, they said that, look, in Africa is just, we see here that most of the corporates are in tertiary care and uh, uh, primary care there is nobody. In Africa they told me, I don't know, I mean, I'm not, uh, don't know much about, it's the opposite. They're saying that all the corporate chains are in primary care and there is no good player in the tertiary care. So already somebody is doing something, we should look at all those uh, solutions and try to find out what is the correct way to get there. But I don't think we have a straightway solutions like this is available and we'll just remember to take it. Yeah. I would uh, sort of slightly diverge from the point. Uh, I think the whole uh, topic of today's debate is on low cost uh, versus affor affordability. Now I think we, uh, I, at least we believe that we need to question what is low cost. Thing is, when you go to a big bazaar or, or, or uh, if I as a consumer go to a supermarket, I already have a benchmark of what is the, a fair price versus what is a reasonable price and what is not. Whereas in healthcare, it's not something that you consume on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. It's, on a, it's a one-off event or rather it's an infrequent event except when you are a chronic patient. So some, somebody who's suffering from acute care, to be uh, very frank, uh, the person has no clue what is a fair price. So, so only if you are a chronic patient then you would know what your daily or your weekly diabetes cost of you know, medication. 
So hence, I, I would sort the reason I took a diversion is that when 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 the question is posed, is low cost healthcare delivery possible? Everybody across the spectrum would believe what they are paying is more than what they should have paid because they have no clue what is a fair price. There is no benchmarking of prices. Uh, there are players who are already into low cost health delivery and this I am speaking purely from personal experience. I have very limited uh, national uh, uh, awareness of how healthcare delivery happens across the nation. But specifically from an urban perspective, where would somebody go when they would really, really want low cost healthcare? The first option is to go to a, a government facility where you would probably have to stand in a queue. but what you would be paying is probably the least you would otherwise, uh, is the least you would have paid. The second option is probably going to a charitable trust kind of setup where you would know your cost of treatment would be fairly you know, reasonable. There again the trade-off is there, the trade-off is not a long queue but more in terms of the quality, perceived quality of treatment that you would get in a charitable trust kind of uh, setup. So, hence, where do the bulk of people go to? Bulk of people go to a private provider because he's more accessible, he's available till, uh, especially for primary care, he's available till 12 in the night. You can call him up and ask him, Dr. Saab, you know, I have a problem with my child, what do I do? So, hence, uh, but, uh, sort of to just summarize, I know I'm sort of uh, all over the place, but just to summarize, when, you, when we say is low-cost healthcare delivery possible, we believe that at least we in SWAS believe that peop there is no benchmarking of prices, what is a fair price. And second is, people already have an option. So even if you are talking of a low income household who, who is seemingly not well educated, for them it is a purely economic decision. They prefer going to a local quack because, you know, he or she has a sardi zukham which, which he knows probably he will be given an antibiotic or probably a paracetamol. So the person, a quack, can, cannot really uh, 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 sort of screw up his case. But if, it's, if the child is ill or if the, the lady of the household is ill, they prefer going to a slightly more specialized person, to a specialist or an MBBS doctor. So for them, it's an economic decision which they take based on the circumstances. And people are quite smart, is what we have realized. So, uh, just wanted to add. so what we are discussing here is, uh, you know, uh, as, as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Shantanu mentioned that we, uh, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, tertiary care being available but not primary. So the question here to you would be, wh why is it that we've not seen a lot of primary uh, health care or affordable primary health care today? You know, while some work has already been done but still we've not seen a lot there. I think yeah, the question is less on the availability of providers, more on the on, on the price that you charge the consumer. So, okay, let me just again rephrase my answer. Uh, this is again different in different parts of India. Uh, so, somewhere on the western and southern belt of India, there are ample providers. Even if you go to a fairly decent village, a fairly like a 1500 to 2000 odd population village, you will, you may not find an MBBS doctor, but you would find a BAMS doctor and somebody who's practicing. So, to, to your point, there are there are already entrepreneurs and let's not discount these guys out. They are all also entrepreneurs in some way and they are at the end of the day still delivering service. So there are providers available uh, but probably not organized. Probably not organized as a chain of clinics, a chain of healthcare providers and hence probably the quality, the pricing, the way they are marketing their services, the range of services is not standard or uniform. Dr. Shantanu, can you just add to the benchmarking point that he's mentioned? How do we really come to the uh, price benchmarking at the primary uh, healthcare level? Because you're, you're also at the, uh, you know, uh, with the family doctor clinics. Yeah, I think um, that's, that's a good point. What he was trying to tell is that, see, uh, it is unfair to say that there is no primary care available. There is something or other available, right. you know. Right. Uh, I have extensively traveled in the village of West Bengal, where I come from. There is somebody available, these are the quacks and things like that. So, honestly there is no price benchmark. Like yes, uh, yesterday Arvind was saying that zero is the price what you have to achieve. Right. There are some people which is like that. Right. So, rather than thinking of price benchmark, you have to think of price differentiation. How do you package the same thing in a different so what and then able to cross subsidize, you know, because it is a very wide range, you know. Right. 
But your previous point I wanted to address a little bit, uh, the primary care as he said that primary care has been there, you know, but it's not organized, it's not benchmarked, there's no quality, this thing. So, but I see a ray of hope, uh, what I saw yesterday when uh, we were the Sankal finalists two years ago. So, we are the only people who were talking at that time of primary care and whomever I went, they said this is, uh, it doesn't make sense and investors is my person even that. So, you are complete mad, that's what I was feeling. You know, but we just kept on. But it was great to see yesterday, all the three finalists is from primary care. So, I feel that that's, you know, what yesterday we were talking about building the ecosystem. I think this is getting traction. We need to more and more people come into this and try to do various things. And thanks to organizations like Swasti who is trying to work as a catalyst. So, the whole ecosystem needs to be built to uh, this thing. And we need to bring attention to other important stakeholders like government, you know, they are spending so much on RSBY and, uh, you know, trying to be encouraging people to be unwell. In my view, what is this insur tertiary insurance? That I have no incentive to be well. I want to be unwell to get. Uh, so, we need to go and tell policymakers that look, primary care, this is where you want to put the money. So, we need more and more people coming to this space and then, uh, and, but I see that that change is happening. In this two years, I see uh, there are at least 10, 12 organizations I know who is trying to make a viable primary care solutions, you know. Uh, so that's, that's a great uh, change in two years I've seen. Yeah. Can I just add another dimension to that? And I think to the question uh, or rather your responses on primary care, I want to add um, the whole issue of preventive and, and screening. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have today that when somebody is ill, they're seeking care. But that's not what we want. We don't want somebody to be so ill that they're, you know, uh, coming to a point where they need secondary or tertiary care. We want to be able to look at conditions that can be managed or, you know, prevented completely. Uh, Arvind, Dr. Arvind yesterday was talking about non-communicable diseases. And today we are still struggling with sort of just life and death issues. Being born and surviving in our country is still a challenge for the population that we talked about again yesterday saying, they're at, uh, the population we're talking about is having an income of a dollar and a half a day or less, right? So we're in the preventive care space, and I still think that we don't see enough entrepreneurial interest in the preventive space. I think primary care, I agree with Dr. Shantanu, so slowly starting to move, but not so much on uh, preventive care uh, across India in remote areas. So, so what you mentioned is a very pertinent point purely because there does not seem to be a business model around preventative health. But uh, this is something that we realized over the last couple of years. You can actually turn it to your advantage. Uh, I'll tell you how we do it. Uh, so there are four key areas we picked up. We, diabetes, hypertension, uh, anemia, and uh, the other is around safe drinking water. Now, especially for the low income, as you rightly said, uh, non-communicable diseases probably is severely underdiagnosed. People don't even know. Even today, the biggest killer in Bombay is heart attack. There is this common thing. People say off ho gaya. What they mean by off ho gaya is people probably had a heart attack, cardiac arrest. The way we are trying to address this problem is we are going and doing diagnosis in the community, doorstep delivery of diagnostic. So we have these health workers who go in the community. They have a, a digital BP machine. A, a glucometer. So, it can be a very random check. And if somebody is diagnosed to have something which is way off the normal, the first recommendation is please go check yourself at the Swast Health Center. So, in a way, we are expanding the market. While there was no market there before, people don't even, didn't even know, these people now are more aware. So, it, for us, it works in two ways. One, it is a very good marketing exercise. People feel that, oh, you have made me aware that I have, a, I have diabetes. B, once you get these patients into your center, now if somebody is suffering from diabetes, he probably needs his medication throughout his life. So in a way, you have sort of got a fairly reasonable, stable revenue stream also coming to you. Now, I, I'm not sure this applies across the board for all preventative stuff, but definitely for things like diabetes, hypertension, to an extent probably screening of, uh, of, of of eye ailments, uh, anemia, 30% to 40% of kids and women are anemic. Now, what does that entail? You detect, now you, you have this very basic stuff, you have this WHO kits, 
you do a pinprick, you know, measure it against a chart, at least you know a broad range, whether somebody has 8 to 10 or 10 to 12. Now, if somebody is anemic, you put them through a whole three-month cycle of iron and folic acid. So, in a way, you are sort of getting patients into your center, trying to expand the market. Uh, for some, definitely possible, uh, not sure whether it applies for all. I think the next question, and Dr. Shantanu already started talking about this a little bit, was uh, sort of the challenges as entrepreneurs working in um, healthcare uh, and low-cost models or working with BOP populations. What are the challenges that are, you're facing? And you started talking about you need to work with government, but then there are also the, the challenges of working with um, some of the existing policies around insurance. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, maybe uh, KC or Dr. Shantanu actually wants to address that issue. What, what are the challenges that you're facing? So I think <clears throat> we come from a very different uh, space, even though we are in the healthcare. And uh, I think um, uh, Ankur talked about preventive care. So components for delivering low cost uh, probably is categorized into four areas. One is the infrastructure cost. Second is manpower or women power cost. Third is drugs. And fourth is uh, devices. Uh, so our focus is basically on how do we make uh, devices uh, out of this question. So how to make the devices to be affordable. And more importantly, how to make the devices on the preventive side. While it can also be used for the curative part, how can we make it a little bit of how do we democratize uh, screening or how do we democratize uh, specifically eye screening, what we do. So, technology has to be there. So, not that technology does not exist, but technology has to be adequate and appropriate for this kind of an activity. So, we can't go and put a 50 lakh equipment uh, in, in a, one of the uh, urban slums which Ankur is working and expect it to actually give return on investment in a year or two years. So, obviously, it has to be amortized and when it gets amortized, the cost on the individual cases will go up. So you need to have technology which is good enough, uh, which can diagnose a problem and ensure that the patient does not get into a curative stage. Because the problem is not, not only about identifying and screening, it's about we have hardly uh, uh, 1 is to 2,000 ratio of doctors to patient. So uh, if that is the case, you know, if everybody fall ill as per that, it's not going to be possible to actually treat either of them. So, the best way to do that is ensure that, especially some of this chronic stuff, to ensure that they don't get into that category and screen them much more early. But the challenge, as Ankur also said, that is building a business model around that. So how do we build a business model? And that is where I would say the critical challenge is. So uh, everybody agrees preventive care is important. Everybody agrees primary is important. Every, there is also a lot of specialities which have come up and, uh, you know, a lot of Investors have put in money in uh, specialty clinics. But then, end of the day, the challenges are that uh, we have a limited number of doctors, we have the patient paying capacity is low, and uh, the mindset of actually going and getting something for preventive is not there. So that is the challenge. So you'll have to, you know, whatever your solution is, has to behaviorally and realistically be within that, uh, you know, in that and then solve the problem. I'm just going to now maybe turn to Pradeep as well and see if you want to take that uh, question on challenges. I do. In fact, I was just uh, wanting to jump in. I think there are a lot of points where I agree and I think uh, uh, there is no such thing as a right price. I agree with you. There is uh, what is affordable, it depends on whom you're talking to and where you're located and what's happening. So in that sense, I would agree with you. And. Um, I mean, just look at any specific ailment or any specific, uh, the rates vary across from where you travel. I mean, there's a rate in Bangalore, there's a different rate in Shimoga, and there is a different rate in Delhi. So, obviously, for, for, the, for the same disease, obviously, it, it doesn't mean that. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, I'm, I was listening to Dr. Arvind yesterday as well, and I think the doctor at the end of the day is the same person. So, uh, and the reason some of the business models are inherently more innovative or inherently more interesting is because they have built 
a surrounding support system around them to make the end overall cost of delivery much more cheaper and affordable and which need not be only restricted to interior hinterland but could also be relevant equally in larger places as well. And so there is no reason it cannot happen. That is a huge opportunity cost of healthcare. I mean today what's happening is a lot of people, I think there's a statistic of four times people get into poverty because of one incident of healthcare or something. There's an opportunity cost and people don't mind paying healthcare. 80% of all healthcare costs in India are out of pocket expenses. People don't mind borrowing and from our experience in our uh, microfinance areas, we find that a lot of people take loans because of emergencies, of, uh, because of immediate needs for something like that. So if you are able to actually, I think the key to all this is providing healthcare when it is required, at the place it is required and when that's where the, uh, it's not just in healthcare, even from from cotton spinning onwards to ATM machines to healthcare, it's all the same thing. If you are able to provide services at the location where the person is needing it at a cost, the cost automatically comes down if you are able to have a surrounding support system around that and that's been our learning. And I think uh, it is indeed possible to reduce costs across the four dimensions that Casey mentioned in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, doctors, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, uh, I mean why should a dialysis cost three times more in Bangalore as compared to why it should cost something in one third of that. I mean you still make money if you have a certain volume of number of renal patients. There's no reason it should not and it's just that you need to have a minimum ticket size. You need to have a minimum number of traction volumes to make it viable and that volume is far more easily achieved in Bangalore or in Mumbai as compared to achieving it in, uh, uh, in uh, Kolhapur. So as long as you're able to find it and having cheaper machines, having cheaper ecosystem around it is all just enable us to that. So I think it is eminently possible, it is eminently doable and the reason you see investor interest coming in is because of these two factors, it's eminently possible and there are interesting people who are doing it. So I think, uh, I think, I think this is a great time to look at this place overall and I think uh, not just in the pharma place but also in terms of the overall systems, in terms of uh, training for example, this can just look at the expand the nurses for example are a key area the paramedical staff are a key area, the outreach people are a key area, uh, health and water is a key area, sanitation, indoor air pollution, seven, two million people died out of indoor air pollution as per WHO standards. So cooking stoves is a key area. So if you look at this whole ecosystem, there is no way where you stop what is preventive and what is curative. Um, sorry Pradeep, I'm just going to continue the question actually. Yeah, because of course. one of the issues that we're talking about is, is challenges, right? And we're saying that in this ecosystem, government is a, is a key player because when you come to nursing, you come to outreach Government, workers. I don't think so because I mean 80% of all healthcare expenses in India at least is out of pocket expenses. And I think uh, the reason it's happening like that is also because of there is an over, over reliance on uh, the primary healthcare setup, there is a district healthcare, there's a PHC, there's a C, CHC. I think part of it is if there is a more sharing, it can also bring down to reducing costs. And there is a monopoly is always increased costs. And, and again, just coming back to policy, because Shantanu brought up the issue of policy and, and incentives and needing to work on issues that where policy is coming from government, right? So for example, working with the, the whole issue of manpower, for example, uh, has a lot to do with education, has to do a lot with the kind of uh, the systems that are set up right now to deal with it and that has... Ten lakh graduates, no jobs, only one-tenth of that are doctors. Right. And, and where do you find one is to two thousand could be... Right. And the doctor one shortage... One is to twenty thousand. Correct. We, we're never going to address the doctor shortage it seems like and it seems like nursing is where the focus needs to be but clearly we aren't uh, going beyond nursing education. So just looking, going into the challenges a little bit more and seeing if you want to add anything there and if there is a role for... Um, outside of the private sector to look at what are the… Yeah, uh, I think uh, we just need to be pragmatic. I think uh, the reality is uh, the way it is. I mean, I think the airline that I flew from yesterday was uh, flown by a pilot who is from Italy. So obviously, the manpower shortage is not just in doctors or healthcare, but even in airline pilots, you now we import. We import coal and we import steel as well. So it's just a factor of… And those are things we really can't do much about it at this moment of time. So we just need to accept things the way they are and try to find a solution within that. And I think if everything were to be 
in in the right thing in the right place and we probably would not be even having to discuss some of these things so clearly the fact that things are not the best situation around is the reality so and we just need to need to work within those constraints and the people who have come out with innovative models are people who have understood and worked around those constraints and i think the reality is that the number of doctors are far 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 lower than the number of people needed the reality is that there are not enough number of centers out there the reality is that there are not in enough connectedness in and not enough sharing happening but i think if we wait for that then i think it's just going to be too long we just need to find solutions now so uh, just just to add on this so pradeep you mentioned about cost differentiation in various cities for different treatments and uh, do you think it would have helped if probably everyone was just requ uh, you know required to use the pricing given by the government say cghs because they have a pricing for all nabh certified hospitals and non nabh certified hospitals so do you think is there a need for someone to really charge more than that because we have examples where hospitals are really making money even on the nabh pricing See, rajasthan government may 346 odd medicine the something was distributed free of cost as per the election manifesto last right. time and the government was voted out of power so i think uh, you know there is a perception of what comes free need not necessarily be what is good or right, even drona asked for the finger thumb of vehicle of your right so obviously i mean you, unless there is a value for money and so obviously people don't mind uh, paying i mean i don't think the problem is paying they just, they just need to get value for money and the value for money is more important than the ability to pay i agree i agree and so so there are examples where hospitals are charging like say for a bypass surgery say 1.5 lakhs versus fortis or larger hospitals which are charging even 2 and 1/2 3 lakhs yeah, obviously the rental costs amortize i mean obviously if you are in a larger city i mean why is that uh, if you eat in a big hotel you you pay more as compared to eating in a roadside dhaba is your amortization of your costs your doctors are expecting more hmm. all these come into play but so, sorry i didn't get your question so, so it's about can can really uh, government uh, making it necessary on these kind of uh, treatments making the pricing uh, mandatory for all hospitals will help because that will also help in reducing your out of pocket uh, expenses i think uh, a government playing a role in just one segment of this entire pipeline i don't think is a good idea if uh, if if you if we are seeing that to be a road map then 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 the then the intervention has to be across the whole value chain right from the supply of doctors from institutions supply of nurses supply of medical colleges if you if everything is getting done in that way then probably th then it's a much larger debate so but trying to get involved only in one segment in terms of pricing alone everything else remaining the same it only just leads to more crony capitalism or crony coercion or crony whatever we want to call it so i don't think it's a good idea to be intervening only in one part there are 36 regulators in india right across all segments and i think the more regulators necessarily doesn't mean better business for all around so mm -hmm. and that's because we are only entering into one part of the whole value chain so either you be in play a role in entire value chain or just leave the entire value chain to find its own water levels on its own so right and right now we are in a system of the government not wanting or trying to or maybe wanting to but unsuccessfully in some parts successfully in other parts trying to play a role in the entire value chain so i think uh, while that might take its own time and maybe we'll see how where the water level finally stops at but i think the practitioners are not waiting for that to happen they would rather just go ahead and try to see what they can do within the system okay so uh, my my next question uh, is for deva on um, you know on the technology side now can technology deliver the desired results and and with your experience uh, over the last 8 10 years on on the healthcare and especially on the medical device industry uh do you feel there's a clear opportunity uh on the technology side to help reduce costs and also to uh increase accessibility of healthcare yeah over over the last several years uh technology has played an important part in terms of how you deliver care now we have uh chandrasekhar sitting there and his his company works closely with a company in which we have invested in in doing the screening at a at a speed and at a rate which is which makes it easy for us to uh, actually identify people with those kind of problems so technology has an important role there are a number of people who are trying to address 
one of the four aspects uh, of ensuring that healthcare is affordable and which is on the devices side. GE does a lot of work, at least there's a lot of noise on what GE does. Uh, they're talking about a portable X-ray machine. They're talking about, a, talking about several innovations that are coming that side. There are several companies which are looking at doing devices at a much lower cost. Now, you have interventional devices that are uh, currently available in the market which can be today produced at costs that you will be very, very surprised at. And they can, even let's say a cardiac intervention device, today can be produced at such a cost and made available at a price which would make uh, addressing the large heart uh, healthcare problems in the heart side easy. You have, technology has leapfrogged. In India, there are people who are doing it at a much, much lower cost and they are able to be in a position to ensure that those interventions happen and uh, deliver healthcare at a very affordable price. Can I just add something, if you don't mind? Sorry. Sorry, I, was just, I just remembered uh, an article I was reading yesterday, an interview with the Deputy Dean of Business of Booth School, from where Raghuram Rajan also comes from. I think he was just talking about the dynamics of the whole larger organized business across any sector, including healthcare. And what he said was, um, and also relates to your earlier question about regulatory enforcement of certain things on and certain areas. I think the nature or the implied behavior of organized business is to keep innovating and improving a productivity or improving on efficiency. So improvement on technology or improvement on product infrastructure is bound to happen and that's the way the industry is designed to function. That's the way organized industry always works. And, and that's in a, in, over the longer term that's beneficial for both the consumers and for the sector itself. And what we need to find is the ecosystem around that to support staff in terms of service delivery that who will go along with the product innovation category. So which I think is an area where the private sector or the innovators are already playing a role on the improvement of technology aspect of it, which is, which is to be expected. And how do we plug the other, um, uh, other parts that go along and therefore uh, make this whole system viable in the where the location is? So. See, the role of technology actually comes, it, it comes over a period of time. Now, if you look at uh, eye care, now, over, let's say 30 years ago, if you had a cataract operation, you probably would be in your... Uh, in the hospital for a week. Today you are out in 15 minutes. Now technology has evolved over time. Emulsification technologies, fake emulsification, a lot of those things have evolved over time. Today to create an opportunity for you to address the large prevalence of this particular cataract problem in the country. Now this is a culmination today. The reason why you're seeing such a large amount, number of people coming into this eye care uh, chain business is because technology has enabled you to deliver eye care at a very reasonable uh, price and do it very fast. Again, technology in terms of, you know, what you put in into the eye to ensure that the person with cataract then can see. Again, you have multiple options. You have within the chains people giving you options of per eye treatment at about 10,000 bucks where they put in a lens which is locally made and it's made at a much, much uh, lower cost than what you get from outside. Now, to me, low cost is a very absolute concept. I think uh, when we talk of, we talk of a price point as uh, saying, it, to me, uh, what is more important is the affordability. Now, within a particular chain today, let's say you go to Arvind, Arvind will tell you that if this is what you can pay, I can give you a cataract operation at a particular price. Now, if you go back and tell him that I can, I, I want a much better solution, I want something where I can, uh, I can have a, a graded vision, I just don't want to do only reading, then he can give you a much higher cost solution. Now, it's made it affordable, it's made it accessible to people across a particular geography. The fact that it, the low cost concept in, in itself is a very absolute concept. It has to be affordable, it has to be affordable to the kind of population that you are addressing. You take uh, the other experience that we've had with cancer care is that if you take it to a smaller place like, let's say, Ranchi or Vijayawada, 
the fact that you're putting in some very high cost equipment is making a difference to a person who's getting treatment there because the total cost of treatment then comes down from Ranchi if you're going to Delhi and the entire family moves to take care of the person the cost there is going to be much more higher than for you to get the treatment let's say in Ranchi so the fact that you have to make it accessible and affordable is probably far more important than having an absolute concept of a low cost so uh I, I just sort of wanted uh, to make a point uh, there. I think uh, what happens is uh, technology, no, nobody questions the, the, the real value that technology adds. I think the, the place where the people who are innovating on technology, where they face a challenge is when the adopters of technology take time to adopt. To give a very practical example. Now, there are very standard rapid tests for detection of malaria, which is probably as easy to use as probably a rapid test for detection of pregnancy. Now a pregnancy strip test is still being very widely used, adopted, you can buy it over the counter, use it, everybody's happy. But a doctor, a WHO approved standard kit for detection of malaria would not be adopted by a doctor purely because he would say, why take the risk, I might as well send a blood sample to a lab. So I think there's a mindset change that needs to be, and that's the challenge which most innovators of technology face. Even today, we have very, very good innovators present in the market for detection of hemoglobin, non-invasive, but when you take it to a doctor, he will say, I'll use a tried and test it. It may take half a day. I'll rather send it to my lab. And that's the challenge which technology guys face. Uh, again, doctors, again, are again a big challenge. Things like, in the West, you have decision support systems. You know, you plug in the uh, chief complaint and diagnosis and probably you get recommendations like an NHS has. Recommendations on what could be the possible medications. Here in India, if you try that, if a doctor sits on a laptop punching in figures, the first guy who's going to complain is the patient. He'll say, either you don't know what you're doing, please give, give me time, don't sit in front of the laptop. I think that's the biggest challenge which we have is A, getting some of these innovations which are of course a GA will have an FDA approved device but somebody who does not have an FDA approved device will find it very difficult to sell it to a specialist or a doctor or a hospital. And the second is the mindset of consumers who probably will be the first person to discourage the doctor from adopting any technology. Uh, I mean we are quite new to it and these are the things which we have seen around. I'm sure sir you will be able to uh, sort of elaborate more as to how we could possibly get around these? I think it's a great challenge. I mean, we also, coming from NHS, etc., we try to put all those decision support. We, encourage, we give doctors laptops, we tell them to do. But this is what, I mean, we are very strong on uh, tracking customer feedback. We have 70% fill-up rate. So one of the feedback I got suddenly for a senior doctor, see, I went there and the doctor is looking at uh, internet to find the answer. I can do that as well. What is the kind of doctor you have, you know? So it was a shocker for us, so this thing. But I just wanted to bring a little bit, I mean technology, I am a big believer in technology, but one thing is that yesterday as we heard that a large amount of cost is fixed cost. So how do you reduce fixed cost? And I wanted to tell you that I think the healthcare needs to start, uh, learn from startups. What I mean by that, what do you do in a startup? Startups cannot hire marketing manager, finance manager, what do we do? We all work two, three days, say, okay, you do take care of marketing and so basically you create more general managers, you know. So our whole system, both uh, the doctors and nurses, the way we are trying to train that, okay, this guy, let's, let's take a PHC. You have to put a surgeon, you have to put a gynecologist, and you put a physician. Now look at their training program. Surgeons, for three years, he learns to do a gallbladder, he does an appendix, he does a colorectal, and he does all sorts of surgery. Uh, and then gynecologist also is learning for cesarean, and they are doing hysterectomy, and, and then the physicians is learning, uh, you know, sort of uh, all difficult nephrotic syndrome as well as pneumonia. What you need is somebody who can do the first of its like, I can also do an appendix, I can do a cesarean, and I can treat pneumonia. So from a vertical specialization, you need to move to general specialization. And uh, as you say, necessity is a... Uh, mother of innovation, I was in Nepal and was, uh, I think they have come up with something called, they call it MDGP. What they do, they treat, uh, train generic doctors differently on different skill sets. 
you know, and that will significantly will reduce cost. You know, now we are trying to do task shifting. We are trying to put more and more to nurses. But when we started getting into nurses, we saw the same. Okay, I am a cardiac nurse, I am an orthopedic nurse. I said, okay, now there's another task. So we started putting a program called practice nurse. Okay, you can supervise the TMT, you can take blood. So, and I said, look, there is no need to have a separate something called front office. Let also they teach them customer service. So how do you reduce fixed costs is do multitasking and generic and really question your age-old process of, as I say, vertical specialization. You know, you have to be being unreasonable. I said, look, it doesn't make sense to train surgeons for three years to do all these things. Let's have a horizontal specialization. So this will be radical thinking. And as you have to start being unreasonable and say, look, it, will, it has to be revolutionary. So I think that's the way to do it. For example, and also technology which will enable us. Like, you know, if you take the Foras machine, it helps a GP to do at least, let's say, 30% job of an ophthalmologist. I, it may be, I may be wrong in quantification. What I'm trying to say that that's the way to go about it, you know. Uh, trying to bring more general managers rather than specialist managers, which will be at the end, uh, like a tertiary care, it's fine. But if we're at the bottom of the pyramid, we should focus more on general skill worker. You know, all, all levels, doctor, nurse, healthcare workers, everything. Can I just add to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah please, please. No, I think I completely agree with uh, what doctor said. And I think uh, the, there is a recent, there's been a lot of talk about Jugaad innovation in India. And I think that is also a counter discussion on the limits to Jugaad innovation. And I think, um, uh, I think in some hospital in, in the east of India, when there was no power supply, the infant mortality being as high it is, young pre-born babies were warmed using mobile phones. I mean, people had to go to the extent of warming their just born kids on using mobile phone heat because they, they had no, I mean, normally what do you do in a hospital? Babies are just born under lights and then you keep them warm and there was a company who did this warm, I mean, baby warmers as well. I think, I think one realization that we have is while we are very good at this uh, on-spot jugaad, thinking about how to find multi-uses for what we otherwise was not supposed to use. I think um, one way that the industry, I think my understanding of healthcare has gone is we have uh, trying to get into more organized systems of better technologies and to meet the aspirations of the people as well. I mean, when they, I think the definition of an organized sector is where you are leading to better solutions and yet not at a highly incremental cost. If we are able to do that, then the, probably the direction to take is provide better technologies but not too much of an incremental cost. I mean, just to add to what you just said, so. I think a um, uh, couple of things. Uh, so when we started um, to actually uh, work on this mission of, okay, in fact, we were inspired by Dr. Arvind uh, six, seven years back and that's where uh, was the genesis of for us. So when we looked at the problem, we looked at preventable blindness as a problem and then we did not want to create a medical devices company. The, the focus was this is the problem, this is the limitation, this is the reality. So all these three things we can't change, right? We can't make doctors overnight and uh, you can't bring down the cost and you cannot say that. So all these, with these limitations, we found that if we have uh, a product with this ABC specifications can be used by minimally trained people, does not require dilation because it was preventive care. So we first went and made that. And when we deployed it, we started deploying it from the top. So from the specialist who are ophthalmologists. And that's when you get the kind of uh, uh, confirmation from them because the specialists, when they start using, uh, it gives you a lot of confidence, credibility. Because when it goes to generalist, then it gets kind of branded as a generalist device rather than as an ophthalmology device, specialist device. So today, the same ophthalmologists are using these devices, putting it in general physicians and diabetologists and uh, none of, n not their specific areas. Because in preventive care, and I'll give you one very classic example which we encountered. Uh, we, we worked with one of the big hospitals in Indore and uh, we did a project with uh, the regional transport uh, office in Indore. And uh, there they said people who actually came for renewing their license, the private drivers, 
uh, uh, the, uh, the auto, taxi and bus. And they had to undergo uh, comprehensive eye screening before they get their license renewed. And in about five months, we screened about 15,000 people. And you will be shocked to find that about 39% had visual problems. 39%. And the fact is, even 4% had color blindness. And in fact, we asked them, you know, how did you see the signal? They said, anyway, we'll see which, the, 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 in which line it is, so we'll decide uh, it works. So, it, it clearly proves that these guys did not come to get their eyes checked. They came to renew their license. But we found that there is 39% problem. So, actually, if you go deeper, you will be able to prevent, because the cost actually also is cyclic. As it, the disease progresses, the cost of curing and the curability factor uh, becomes very difficult. So instead of curing somebody at, you know, in a, in a, in a critic, in an early stage, if you allow it to go to a very deteriorating stage, then the cost obviously goes up because it's not infrastructure, it is not people. So if you take Agarwal or Vasan or IQ, which are one of the big hospitals, in OPD they will charge 200 rupees, but they will charge for a cataract surgery 20,000 rupees. That's it right. both take the same one hour, right? So the fact is, because it is a surgery, it is 20,000. Because it is OPD, it is 200 rupees. The time is one, that one hour. The doctor is that same person or probably one grade lower. But still, so if we are able to do this, but some cataract, for example, is, is related to age. So you will get it. You can kind of move it by a couple of years, but you will get it. But then if you are aware of it, you can actually do it at a much earlier stage. But there are these... Chronic diseases like diabetic retinopathy or glaucoma, which are non-symptomatic, that if you can prevent it early by actually catching and probably through a drug or even by a drops, which will cost much, much lower, then actually it will be very significantly, you can not only save but also have lower cost. So I think this is a question we'll open to the panelists and then subsequently we open it out. Uh, to our audience here for questions. And we want to come to this question of uh, sustainability. I know um, we talked about the business model being itself the biggest challenge, but if we want to talk about impact and impact for the masses, um, what, what do you think models need, business models need to uh, actually address to get sustainability right, to be sustainable, and to create impact? And anybody can start. I don't think there is any question. Is there a... No, the question is what, is, what are the kinds of models required? Because we're saying we don't have... Sustainability, one. sustainability and sustainability. It has to be SSS and then... Yeah, but how do you scale. achieve that? So I think we've, we've talked a little bit and said we need scale, we need volumes. But I also hear the, quest, the, the challenges that have come up. So I'll, what do you I'll think? I'll actually agree with him. Uh, our whole thought process has changed over time. So we started off from being a company which will say we will only give fixed returns to investors that end of the spectrum, to now understanding the ground reality that for any enterprise, cash flow is important. Uh, you need two, two po uh, points of infusion of cash. One is when you're starting, which is seed capital. The second is growth. Now, you may, uh, based on some uh, Excel sheet or based on very, some very fancy presentation, you may still be able to convince people to put in money for the seed, see, on, at the seed stage which is fine, which will probably sustain you for a couple of years. But once you are at a growth stage, the story needs to be very clear. Story needs to be very clear to, to the investors who are coming in as well as to yourself. Now hence, to answer your point, I think, uh, again, we have diluted our stance over time, but we now realize that cash flow, your ability to uh, have comfort for the next 15 months in terms of whether you will be able to pay your people's salaries, whether you will be able to pay for your inventory cost is paramount. I think without that, I mean, we can keep doing what we are doing, but we'll probably extinguish ourselves in, in the next six months. So I, I think the, the reason somebody would have started an enterprise at the first place, the question about uh, uh, the social impact is a given. If the, because somebody is starting something which helps in early detection of eye care or somebody starting a primary care chain or somebody is starting something which is a low cost diagnostic equipment, I think that is a given that they are probably, the intent was always there. Of course, you may sort of steer away from your course, we are away from your course, but that's secondary. 
ultimately if an enterprise has to survive there needs to be cash there needs to sustainability cannot be ignored i think just let me add this because i think uh, probably what we really want to ask here is what will uh, what innovations are required or what changes are required in today's business models to make them more sustainable because hmm. we've heard of all the challenges yeah. and we know that people are struggling to scale and sustain yeah. so what as per you and because hmm. you've changed your business models as well what do you think is now required to make the model more sustainable and probably go pan india or you know go deeper into remote areas uh, so so uh, so yesterday i had this interesting conversation with somebody who had come from finland it's just a very small country they have their own set of healthcare issues he 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 gave me an articulation of their framework as to how they design their health systems which i could i could relate to so he said the we went to design a health system there are he calls it a trilemma it's not a dilemma it's a trilemma so the three corners of the triangle are one is access the other is services and the third is speci specialization now how does it relate to me as an enterprise a is access how close am i to my consumer am i last mile or am i in the just one facility in the center of the city so the second is of obviously as an enterprise you would want to be as close to your consumer but that comes at a cost when you are at the last mile your availability of real estate will be very minimal so then you try to maximize revenue from your unit so what you do is the second angle which is into services you try to have as many services as you can be it uh, you, you cannot survive on just one model you can sell drugs you can do equipment selling you can probably do some bit of consultancy but then that comes at a cost whether you are fragmenting your energies the third is which he said they had chosen consciously to go with is on the specialization side which is uh, the, all the enterprises or most of the government and infrastructure is geared towards super specialization which again which is once you specialize you cannot have it at the last mile it has to be at a at a central place where you have a larger premises you have lots of facilities but then so to answer your point how 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 do you become sustainable i guess each enterprise has to take a call which at least i can relate to it which two or at least one side of the triangle do i do i uh, sort of go with for us probably if you ask me we will probably go with the last mile which is access and services try to go last mile try to provide as many services as possible but what i guess again i am sort of again preempting cases answer but probably they would have said i would really want to invest in technology and try somebody else is doing the last mile let them do it best the way they are doing it i will get into specialization so i guess it it's a call which all of us have to take as entrepreneurs which part we want to just to add on to that so uh, i think the technology is pretty important but if if i have to pose a question to you what what is it that is stopping you from getting into say rural areas or remote areas with the business model that you are currently in what would be your answer to that? i think the answer is i think our lack of confidence and understanding of the local nuances india is a million indias what works well here will will know definitely we know that it will not work in calcutta because the nuances are very different what works in bombay will not work in calcutta especially for last mile b2c kind of enterprises it, it, i mean it, the nuances have to be understood you need to invest time and you yeah, i am mean, in it, it the time is time is paramount for us so just want to share about the sustainability for us uh, you know being a retail model we there is no point talking big in a we said so that it's is the center level so first of all you should look at the single center if the center is not doing well something wrong shut down it's pure retail model so what we have seen location plays a very very important role we have done our mistakes but once you get the location right so that's key you know it's a pure like if you're not visible nobody will come you know so one of the learning what you said look invariably when you are early days you say you try to save money on rent and say okay i go to back street etc and you spend much more money on marketing people don't come but give that extra 50000 rupees rent be on high street so that's one b uh looking at see the problem is business is always start by experts that's where the biggest problem is you know like technology they will say okay this is android this is daba this is the as somebody who doesn't understand it i don't really care does it do email so it's no point telling primary care preventive care gp care this care you know 
So what I realized that, you know, we came with an expert and this is what is available. What my customer is asking is there is a different requirement. He says, okay, you're going to give me a consultation and then for another thing you will say you go and buy medicine from there. Because I'm not this business because business school taught me to focus on core competence. What nonsense. You know, the customer does not care whether you're focusing on core competence or not core competence. He wants everything to be there, this thing. So listen to your customer, listen to your local customer, get the location right, make sure that you have a clear mandate that I will do it within 18 months or close down. I think that brings sustainability. What is our learning? We focus on these three things. Uh, I think for a technology provider, scalability uh, is comparatively easier because uh, you know you can quickly scale up. And uh, what is very critical is actually connecting with the right service, uh, the last mile connectivity. So you need to be working with the best companies so that the impact can be seen then and there. So that's the first thing. Second thing is uh, the challenge or probably the growth will be that how do we actually replicate the model which has been uh, done and uh, Ankur was right saying that the dynamics of the place are very different. What works in Bombay or may not work in Calcutta or what works in India will not work in Africa. So understanding that and probably positioning uh, for example what is prevent uh, eradicating preventable blindness in India would probably be convenient screening in uh, probably in US. So, the product is the same, you package it differently, you position it differently and you attract a different set of people and obviously uh, because it's technology and you just can't go to a market and discover that it does not fit in having these five, six parameters and then re go to the drawing board and redo it again. So, you'll have to have all this into consideration when you are making the product for here and then actually enhance that when it actually hits that market. So, for example, whether it's making it uh, the user interface extremely good what people are used to or, you know, making it work in very robust conditions, uh, completely uh, in, in, in solar lighting, if it's going to Africa. So, all these changes has to be done and uh, people have to, and, uh, you know, people also rightly said that doctors don't want to waste too much time sitting in front of laptops. So, it should be quick things which is the imaging and the whole process of going and connecting with the internet and all that should happen in less than three to four minutes. And what happens if internet is not there? So all eventualities you'll have to actually look at and then your solution should be so it should work online, offline. In fact, there are places where people collect uh, the images in a USB stick, drive down, uh, you know, cycle down five, six kilometers, give it to another place where they upload it from the internet. So it's, it's worked all the way. So if you know the, what is the limitation, actually finding a solution is comparatively easier. But actually you'll have to go and work on the ground. So you cannot say I'm an innovator and I'll sit in an air-conditioned room and design. You will have to actually work in the most remotest of places where there is nothing available to you and actually practically see for yourself what is not existing and design and deliver the product which meets that. That's, that's, the, that's the most critical thing. I think I'll just take off from where Casey left. I think ultimately it's all in the mind. I mean, just going many steps back. I think uh, healthcare is classified as an essential sector. So one of the mistakes that uh, sometimes what we have seen that entrepreneurs who think they are in the essential sector, whether they are in healthcare or education or whatever it is, they just think that if you are there, then people will just come to you. So I think, uh, I think if you just remove that mental block, everything else will follow. I mean, that you just have to go out there and slog as hard as anybody else will do, then everything else, you will find answers yourself. So I think you, if you are able to get away, rid of that mental thing that I'm here, so people will automatically come and stand in the line and take avail of my services because I'm a healthcare, I'm nobody else here. It doesn't seem to work like that. People still find their way and go away, which is, am I really getting value for money? So. Uh, you want to share some of your experience on yeah, the healthcare sure. delivery models? You see, ultimately, as uh, doctor put it, right, it is unit economics which is very important. Uh, I think as long, so when we when we started investing in these uh, chains of uh, clinics, uh, we were also given fancy uh, Excel sheets, all of which showed that you know uh, at a point in time where we are, all of them would be extremely profitable and that you would get a tremendous exit. Now, along the way, there is several learnings that come in. Now, ultimately, if you focus on the unit that is delivering the service and you're able to make that a profitable unit, 
I think that is the key. Along the way, you will find other investors coming in who will then take the burden of getting this enterprise to the next stage. Uh, what we have found is now, take doctor's uh, business for example, he now has 30 clinics. Now he starts the next 30, you start looking at the financials, his EBITDA will come down because the, the, the next 30 are pulling down the EBITDA of the first 30. So as long as you have educated investors who are able to understand that the unit economics is important, how the unit economics is changing, what is the team doing to ensure that the unit works, then you have a model which is sustainable. And to my mind, the model is sustainable when you have one set of investors being bought out by another set of investors. Once that happens, then clearly you've built a sustainable model. Have you looked at, is your EBITDA tremendously positive or not positive is not very important. What is important there is that you've built something which to my mind is sustainable at a unit level. And then if you keep adding more and more units to that, you're building a model which is delivering affordable healthcare across a particular specialty. Or if, it, if you're doing secondary or tertiary, we're doing it that way. I think what, that's where the key is. And if you're, if you're able to kind of deliver that, I think one set of investors will come in to take you from one level to another, and the next set will come in to take you from wherever you are to the next stage. And that is where the enterprise in itself becomes sustainable. It doesn't matter who the owners are. What matters ultimately is, is it delivering, and it is delivering more and more of what it wants to do over time. Shantanu, you know, there are some examples where uh, enterprises have started utilizing the primary healthcare center infrastructure, and more, more so like the outsourced management for the same centers. Uh, do you think that model really works? Or Sorry, can you, can you, the, I did not… The primary health centers, the public health system. Yes, yes. Uh, public health system using that uh, kind of… Uh, yeah, so yeah. private enterprises coming in and using I that think that that's the model to go. I mean, this is where we started as an NHS. If you look at the NHS GP model, it is the biggest public-private partnership. You know, all the GPs in UK are private entrepreneurs. They're not, uh, I mean, except probably 2-3% where there is a trust-owned GP. So how does it work is basically uh, the government, let's say that in the Pawai, I have to provide the service, you know, and they create a market. It is not that a monopoly. There might be 10 practices. And the patients can choose one practice over other, but they can't go every transaction-wise. They have to come and register and they can deregister if they are not happy and go to somebody else. Now what the, I think the trick is how they pay. You know, this is where we are wrong and the American system is also wrong, which is a transaction based. So basically, here what is happening in the hospital, let's say, okay, if I see you one time, I will give you this much fees. If I do an operation, uh, I will give you this much fees. And if I do an operation with complication, I will give you more fees, you know. So my whole uh, incentives is to make it more transaction. But let's look at how the NHS pays the GPs. They said, okay, I'll give you 30 pound per patient. So if you have 1,000 pound, 1,000 patients, I'll give you 30,000 pound. But that's a retainer. Now the GP wants to make 100,000 pound. How does it make it 70,000 pound? By follow, getting either public health level outcome or individual outcome. Public health outcome that you have covered 99% vaccination or individual outcome, average age BA1C is less than 6.5%. So then you are not producing more and more, like a diabetic is not, you are not trying to create four visits. You are looking at, okay, how I can change the outcome. So I think that will be key. Before we get into PPP, how the, 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 uh, the payment mechanism need to move from a transaction of fee for service to outcome orientation, you know? and good technology measured to outcome because in India naturally what will happen people will fudge with that. So we have to, but that is easy to solve, we have done it in our clinic. I can measure on a drop of a button a technology uh, like what is the average HP1C for your doctor A versus doctor B, you know, or customer satisfaction. And then you say okay these are the two quality parameters, how the customer sees quality, that is his perception. And secondly, internal quality parameter, with which are this blood pressure, sugar, these are internal parameters. So that is very, very important. And if we get that right, I think that's the way, because uh, healthcare, 
completely leave it to the market will be very, very difficult because there will be people who will not be able to afford it. So that's why the government needs to come in and become a funder. But I think the mecha and then uh, the, the private entrepreneurs are very, will be smart people because they will be able to manage it efficiently. But we need to get this payment mechanism very right. And quick. Points actually. So the PPP model, I guess, uh, Karuna Trust has already been doing it since the last uh, quite many years. I think they have 25 to 30 odd centers. But I think one challenge in the PPP model would be you're moving from a free service to a paid service. Now either uh, the patient is expected to pay at the center, or the government subsidizes on behalf of the of, of the patient. So the the first would be very difficult because suddenly from free you are going to pay. But a latter would again if we get into this whole loop, how often are you getting reimbursed? So that's where probably we can look up the Corona Trust model and figure out what went wrong or what was not that bad. Sorry, the question only there is I think for people who can't afford to pay because I think the sustainability that we're talking about requires that you have people who keep paying and we still have a large population that cannot pay for care. With that, I'll just open it up to the audience to see if you have questions for our panelists. Uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, so, I worked on uh, I worked on Medicare and Medicaid in the states, and uh, some of the questions they were working on uh, are very relevant to what we were discussing. Um, so, one thing is that Medicare is moving from a fee-for service uh, system to basically more of a pay for performance uh, mechanism. Uh, so now they're taking into account you know, the, the geographical location of the, of the hospital or the service provider. Uh, they're taking into account the uh, effect in the uh, reduction in the uh, disease or recurring uh, treatments uh, for these patients. Uh, and the other thing they're doing is um, they're looking at, supposing you get a cataract surgery, um, you know, how does the hospital uh, or the treatment um, how do, how do different types of treatment reduce the cost uh, of, for these patients? Like, um, if you're between 50 and 60, uh, compared to 60 to 70, what is your risk change um, for a cataract surgery, uh, for retinal detachment from a cataract surgery? Uh, so these sort of questions are, are, are what I was sort of addressing. Uh, so my question actually goes to uh, this problem, uh, which is that it requires a lot of data um, to work well. Uh, so, none of the, I didn't hear any, any panels speaking about um, data in, in, the, in this field. And I was wondering how important it is to you. See, this uh, debate of big data in terms of identifying, this is something um, I, can, I can relate to because um, some of the ventures in which we have been involved began with this concept that if we do it, we will have access to data and then we are able to build solutions around that data. But actually, uh, as we have gone into it even deeper, we have realized that unless you actually do it, you will never get data. And unless, and, and to do it in a reasonably large size, you need to have a presence across certain numbers to make the data meaningful to you. And before you reach a level of making, building solution around the data. So we are caught in that, uh, especially I mean, for me, it was uh, an eye-opener to know that in some of our uh, partner companies that the data is like 40. I, I always used to think that diabetes is an urban phenomenon, but they say that 45% of all my patients of rural India is also having diabetes, for example, and people who are having, uh, um, I mean, brain-related illnesses are plenty. In, but this data is got over... Uh, a large number of, uh, an agglomeration of a large number of clinics across spread over a number of areas. So unless you have that presence first, we will never get the data and then you build on it at that time. So today, my guess is the healthcare providers are somewhere in the middle. They are not yet in that spread out to be able to make sense of that data. And we need to reach to that number before we start building solutions around it. Uh, I'll probably add a point to what you said. See, one of the critical things what we do is, uh, actually uh, build business models even around the data, right? Now, for example, um, to a paid preventive care, to a, f a free preventive care, if the doctor knows if he screens 100 people, he will get 20 people with cataract and 10, let's say, will 
actually undergo cataract treatment with him. And let's uh, say that he will get reimbursement from RSBY or… Uh, so, and then he calculates what would be the earning and then goes to decide whether he can do that 100 people free of cost or at 25 or 50 rupees. So, this is been possible because we have been able to collect data and actually justify it. So, we have close to uh, 700,000 people whom we have screened and we have data for more than 200, 250,000. And this data is not only uh, image related data but more data related to, uh, at some point of time we also wanted to say that, you know, people in Punjab or women in Punjab above 40 have a greater tendency to have diabetic retinopathy if they are diabetic than people in Kerala or women in Kerala. So, this is data which we can actually come out and as he rightly said, it will become appropriate only when you reach a critical mass. So, what is that critical mass? It could be 1000, it could be 10,000, it could be a million. But then, you have to use for a business model, probably the data can be uh, at even at 10,000 uh, is good enough. But for certain policy level clinical data, it has to be much more larger because, uh, uh, you know, for example, if you go and do something in Andhra Pradesh, uh, there is a particular sector who has a problem which is very generic to Andhra Pradesh. And if you take that and kind of do your back-end calculation, you may go wrong. So, it's, it's important that you ha must have a large database to do that. And that's actually very critical to actually even reinvent your business model. Right now, there is more in the uh, clinical trials and for pharma, for the pharma side. But in terms of healthcare side, we still need to have the bureaucracy. For pharma to develop new drugs, maybe there is some level we already moved. But, but on the healthcare delivery side, whether you need more gynecologists in this place, whether you need diabetes specialists in this place, whether you need psychiatrists in this place, People aged over 60 are more prone to uh, arthritis in certain locations. We need more… Uh, I think we still are in a, a bit of an inflection point. We have still not reached to that level. Unlike in drugs, for example, where there is some level of movement already. So. Sahil, I, thank you for the question on data. I think there is uh, data today that is available, but more in the public health system. Uh, and I think this is one of the areas where civil society is working with a lot of donors and, and the public health system to look at what data is available because there is data. Unfortunately, the data is in a manner that doesn't allow for a lot of the analysis and we actually have programs, uh, innovators who are working with the public health system to have data, um, you know, on service delivery as well as manpower and actually sort of match that and, and make sense of that and look at some of the things that we're talking about here. But um, I think it's happening more um, in the public health system and, and with civil society and, and donors and think tanks and those working on research uh, rather than um, maybe in the, in the social entrepreneurship space. If you ask any, any business, I think the one of the most severely under, uh, underspent side of the business would be in capacity building. Now, any healthcare project 101 will say that you start with a baseline and then see if you have an impact. Now, if you ask me how much money will I be willing to spend on a baseline study, zero. Because first of all, I need to pay people salaries, blah, 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 rest, the rest. So I think as, as, as entrepreneurs, the only way where we can have access to good data, get a lot of these studies done is through probably the grant route where some of these capacity building stuff is routed through the grant. Otherwise, the business right now, because of this low margin, high volume kind of uh, uh, model, does not give you leeway to invest any, in any of these uh, data collection exercises. I know there were other questions. We have... Uh, uh, hi, I'm Ashok. Uh, my question is in, uh, more into acceptance of innovation by doctors. And uh, there is an excess between uh, doctors, pharma company, and the labs. So, like corruption, we know it exists, but uh, we, don't, we don't have proof for that. So, what I feel is, if the nexus is diluted and more transparency comes, people will actually, doctors will actually uh, encourage innovation. Because there are few diagnostic equipments which can be uh, very cheap, which can be available cheap, and many innovators are there to do that. But uh, still, doctors prefer to send it, send everything to the lab, and that will be huge cost. And uh, what I have seen is some 30 to 40 percent is going to the doctors, kind of thing. 
So how can we eliminate this and uh, bring more transparency and actually reduce the inflated, artificially inflated cost for healthcare? Just two words, more competition. If you have more competition, these things will have better. Sixteen percent of all drugs used in the US is generics made in India. And I think the more, the more competition there is, these things will get better addressed. Right now there is very less competition, so there is, even if you know it, you can't do much about it. Unless you have more competition, if there are people to make differentiators about it, then you can do something about it. Uh, I think, um, see in our case, the adaptability of technology by ophthalmologists has been overwhelming. Okay, so we never had to go and, so in fact, uh, to be honest, when we started, we started with uh, certain technologies which we are not trying to put in, uh, what we call it as uh, uh, decision support system. But then it is actually the encouragement of the ophthalmologist which actually made us to even include that as we go along. In fact, people earlier were questioning, uh, ophthalmologists specialists, why do they need decision support system? But then now, they themselves are pushing because they, see, they can see high volume. So, actually, when you make things which are really useful and you are able to give them the value proposition uh, very clearly, I think people do adapt. People, uh, I think there would be a section, maybe 5%, 10% may be there. But I think predominantly if you have technology uh, which is available and see, he rightly said that the point is it is, the, the doctors are also looking at uh, what throughput they can see and what is the margin uh, per patient, what they will be able to get. So if your technology can actually, you know, help them to see more patients at a lower cost, their overall sustenance on their infrastructure and, uh, you know, uh, manpower uh, which is there, I think the adaptability is quite good. So, you, we don't have to go and, you know, if your technology is very realistic and is able to kind of, uh, you know, solve the problem and it can improve the throughput, uh, what doctor sees one patient, if you can uh, make him to see five patients at the same time, obviously he will give the multiplication factor much lower. So I think, of course, there would be one or two instances here and there, but I think, I think the majority will shift. It's definitely a possibility. Also, I, I guess we all got sort of swayed by Amir Khan's Satyameva Jayate last year. So, but to be very fair and based on our limited experience, we found most of the doctors are actually very genuine people. Now, what we need to understand is, look at a doctor's income, a typical entrepreneurial doctor. Uh, in India, health is a very seasonal thing. So, there will be these so-called monsoon seasons between uh, June till maybe around September, end October, where it will be very good. And then, then there will be this lean season. They call it a lean season, not dry season. Now, nobody wants variability of income, right? If I, I need a steady income, cash in my bank, 30,000, 40,000 rupees. I don't want to be earning 45,000 in a uh, rainy season and then just 5,000 in the, in, the, in the dry season. So to, to his point, I guess we need to have mechanisms where a doctor is, gets a steady income throughout, maybe through Im improving the outcomes, health outcomes in and around where he works. Right now, because there are no such incentives to a doctor, he has this high variability of income. So how do you counter that variability of income? Because still you need to send your kids to a school, you need to pay for an EMI of your motorcycle or your car. How do you do it? You resort to some of these practices. But we believe sincerely that I think around 70 to 80 percent of the doctors are really good, well-meaning doctors. That's why you see a lot of doctors, the GPs now moving to pharma companies. Why have they moved to pharma companies as marketing reps? Because it allows them a steady income. Everybody needs a steady income. So do doctors. And before we come to your question, sir, I just want to say, I think putting, uh, empowering people, I think really uh, can make a difference to the nexus that you're talking about. A more aware, educated consumer can actually question what's happening uh, between pharma companies, between doctors and, and diagnostic labs. Um, and, I, and I think with the innovators that we work with, we are seeing them make a conscious shift to some of the programs because they realize that these are delivering value and, and they're not getting value or, you know, they're, they're, being, uh, they're paying a higher cost because of other things elsewhere. And I think uh, really empowering the people that we're talking about makes a difference. You Hello, have everyone. Yeah, I'm Dr. Vivekanand Singh. I run a diagnostic center in the capital town of Imphal. Uh, Imphal, that's the capital town of Manipur. Uh, I'm one of the 70 scholars uh, for this Sankalp. 
my question is like uh, I have been trying to venture out to the rural parts of Manipur uh, where it's a very underserved area where facilities are almost non-existent but then the population wise if you see the whole population of Manipur is just 20, uh, 23 lakhs if you take the whole note is the ninth stage also the end users number will be very less so I would like to have the uh, this thing of the impact investors like what is their mindset like when the end users numbers are not uh, that much whether they are going to go the, down the last mile with us or whether we should leave the services untouched let the people suffer <laughs> my question well i i mean i don't think so at all doctor i think uh, i think the onus is on you i think if you take the responsibility i don't think investors know what's happening in Imphal or anywhere in Manipur as much as you know. So if you are able to tell us that uh, you will sustain and grow even working in, Manipa, in, in, in Manipur or in Nagaland or etc. I don't think uh, there is any, uh, uh, any dearth of people who are willing to look at. I mean obviously uh, if you take the ownership of proving that it can work, why not? And that, that the reason that uh, in the past there has been a high a degree of urbanization in healthcare, there has been a very low level of rural penetration is the perception that there isn't much money to be made in rural India, but that's clearly changing. And it's clearly changing and changing for the good. And I think if you are able to make your case uh, loudly and clearly, there is no reason why it should not happen. I just want to add, in fact, I have one investor who said that, Dr. Shantanu, the moment you go to Northeast, I will put money. You're not in Northeast, that's why I will not put money. So there are people who will, particularly looking at Northeast, I can put you in touch. Okay. So uh, we are getting signals on, we need to close this, but one last question, Disha. Uh, Dr. Moka is here, Dr. Moka, and I, uh, you know, we, we had an initial thought on primary care centers being available, a lot many being available in Africa versus tertiary care. So I thought uh, probably Dr. Moka could share some thoughts on the primary care uh, availability in Africa and, and versus tertiary care because here it's very lopsided. We have lack of primary care uh, versus tertiary care. And uh, one of the thoughts was that probably Africa is the, on the other side. They have a larger number of primary care centers versus tertiary care. So thought probably you could add some uh, to that. Thank you. Uh, the uh, general assessment of the uh, availability of care being uh, predominant in the primary sector is correct. Uh, and I would elaborate on that on a couple of levels, one in terms of infrastructure, one in terms of personnel, and, and obviously levels of care. And, and touch a little bit about health financing, if, if I may. Uh, the, um, if you look at it from an infrastructure perspective, it's absolutely correct that, um, the, um, that you have uh, uh, tertiary institutions, large hospitals, for example, in Kenya, you had, you know, referral hospitals around the large provinces, which were predominantly owned by government and then uh, supported by the Aga Khan system and some uh, maybe academic hospitals and so on and so forth. And then the next level of care was the district hospitals, which was sort of designed around the, um, the, 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 the primary health care model that you needed referral centers in most districts that, and each district hospital is serving about 25 to 50 health centers and dispensaries. And then you have dispensaries and health centers. And so all, in, in most of East Africa, what you find is that about 80% of the facilities are dispensaries and health centers that are part of a network with a referral process to district hospitals and then the district hospitals are able to escalate their cases to the uh, tertiary uh, health facilities. Now, uh, when you start looking at it based on disease patterns and, 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 um, and, and where patients choose to go, uh, what, is, what, became, what becomes pretty apparent is that, uh, for example, uh, cases of, of uh, complicated cases of pregnancy, all of them are seen at the tertiary care level and nothing's happening at the primary care level. So, the, um, the, the curative care is happening almost exclusively at the tertiary care level and the primary care level is taking care of 
preventive diseases. What that does is it creates tremendous strain on the bottom of the pyramid in terms of revenue generation because they have, been, they have a limited set of formularies, limited di diagnosis they're treating, and pretty much the, um, the care is being provided by nurses and clinical officers. So it is a, it's a, it's a um, almost like an hourglass kind of um, system that's in place whereby you, know, you can have vaccines, uh, family planning medicines, and, and maybe first-line malaria treatment and antibiotic treatment. After that, you have to go to tertiary care to access, you know, so it, it, um, there is no middle zone for, in, for the most part. How does that play with health financing? Because of that structure, health financing has remained very, uh, the penetration of health financing has been limited despite efforts both in the private sector and the public sector. So what we're seeing on the ground is that there is no value for persons in rural areas to sign up for nat the National Health Insurance Program because the National Health Insurance Program, first of all, does not cover outpatient services, and those outpatient services are in the big cities, yeah. and their biggest cost is the cost of locating to the big cities to receive care. So there's really no value for health insurance in that equation. And so what we are seeing as a huge opportunity is to sort of trickle down, uh, uh, either trickle down services where you can have some inpatient services happening in the dispensaries and health centers, so at least build maybe one or two bed capacities at the dispensaries and health centers, such that if you have inpatient benefits, you can use your inpatient benefits at the rural setting, or you now have to have a new risk benefit management process for your insurance products that allow outpatient services to be part of the value proposition to the patients. But that's too risky for most insurers, they don't have a way to adjudicate the clinicians. They don't have a way to uh, reimburse the clinicians. So we caught, sort of caught up in that dynamic, if you will. And so, uh, in summary, the, um, the, 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 the bulk of facilities are dispensaries and health centers, but creative care is really what's it's, um, happening in the big hospitals. And right now, affordability at the bottom of the pyramid is something that is in part driven by lack of access or lack of availability of the, the systems, but also health financing needs to be reformed in order to drive volumes at that level at a very high level. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, and I think, can I just add to that? I mean, I think, uh, thanks for sharing that, and I think it's pretty much mimicking what we are also seeing here, and probably because India is a very big country on its own, some of these problems tend to get magnified n number of times further as well. But just as an as a side event, as an opportunity, what some of the channel partners, for example, now I think like you mentioned, the curative centers are in the big cities where all the insurance guys are also giving insurance and people don't know how to reach there, which is therefore limiting the depth of insurance. I think what some of our portfolio companies that we have seen who are in the microfinancing and credit systems, and to all their customers of in far-flung rural areas and they get insurance packages as part of their whole program and it's actually opened up a new channel for the company to tell these people where to come to in the big cities and which hospital to go, how to come there, how to facilitate them. It's actually become a much better stickiness factor between the, mi between the micro credit giver and the, and the consumer. So in terms of health financing, the insurance financing, this has become an, a new avenue opening up for business opportunity as well. So it could be innovative and maybe helps both sides that way. That's, that's correct. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Pradeep. So, uh, in, in just if I have to just summarize it, we've, we've looked at a lot of, uh, you know, the challenges were discussed and primarily the key challenges were uh, infrastructure, lack of manpower, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the geographical, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the reach, which is very difficult for, uh, for the Indian doctors. And, and then also we looked at differentiated revenue models not being present. Uh, apart from that, we also looked at what would really work in, in the Indian context. And uh, primarily what we need is a change in the, in, uh, the incentivization program uh, for the doctors, by moving from transaction to outcome based, uh, creating revenue models that meet the target segment requirements. Uh, it does not necessarily have to, you know, one model does not necessarily have to fit all. So we need to look at that. And uh, lastly, we need to make sure that the unit economics makes sense. And if that does not really uh, make sense, it's, it gets difficult for um, 
for, for scaling up, it gets difficult for sustainability, and it also gets difficult to get in long-term capital, whether it's equity or debt, to uh, help you grow. So, uh, Shama, do you want to add to that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I think we've covered everything there, and I think the way I would like to sort of sum up is we've been hearing a lot about the ecosystem since yesterday, and I think um, we also started talking about how an ecosystem really needs to be built. And I think social entrepreneurs are a large part of that ecosystem, but there are others, and if we can get working together with the ecosystem that exists or improving the ecosystem that we have with, the, uh, with when it comes to healthcare and reaching the bottom of the pyramid population, I think we will be able to see impact and also see uh, more sustainable business models. So, thank you. So, with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, for participating in this and thank you all the panelists.